Hi, viewers. Okay. <clears throat> As part of our Reading Cities, Language and Identity in Urban Contexts class, uh, we'll be dealing with the theme of what I call all work and no play. Now, the critical questions we will be engaging in today are, um, what is considered recreation or leisure? How is sport contextualized? How are fun, leisure, and entertainment defined in various cultures? And specifically, how do cities cater to and capitalize on this? Now, one of the first critical questions requires us to define our terms. So for just pause and go online and do a quick search. Just search how is recreation defined? How is leisure defined? And the question then is, what do these concepts actually presuppose? Well, interestingly, in looking at you know, various definitions, articles, um, the difference between a job and career has a lot to do with attitude and expectations. Um, you know, here they're talking about steady income, opportunities, advancement. And you know, here we've got this article, is your work play? It can be, <clears throat> which again presupposes that it's generally not. When work is play, don't think of play as an indulgence. It may be the key to your success. The value of play. Well, so again, from a, a, the purposes for definition, the, the very presupposition is that work and play are separately engaged in. Now, whose definition is this then, right? Who would define work-life balance uh, as a, an issue. Is it a myth? Is it a real concern? Why or why not? You know, there are all these concerns about making sure that your, your play and your work are equally represented in your life for mental health, physical health. But again, this also implies that work and play are separate. That work can't be play. If you have to balance the two, they're necessarily separate things, right? There's a very funny, um, yeah, there are lots of funny articles and, and uh, videos about this very topic, but okay. So we're gaining an idea that already we have to step back and define the fact that work and play are necessarily separate entities. Are they necessarily different things? Well... This is an interesting article from The Atlantic. That's a bit old, 2013, but I dare say the concepts prevail. Three signs you are too creative for a nine to five. A work day is just not your thing. So again, this author has you know, presupposed that if one is creative, one cannot be um, expected to work an eight-hour workday, nine to five, right? You can't turn it on and off in that regard. Sometimes you're too unfocused early in the morning. Your brain won't allow you to work for eight hours a day. Jobs should demand fewer hours of work. And they refer to John Maynard Keynes that, you know, work should be better paid by the hour. But again, there's a lot of presupposition that goes into this. Um, you can't work in a cubicle. It's the least comfortable place for your brain. You should be allowed to, allowed to play acoustic guitar for much of the workday, right? When your boss tells you to sign off of Facebook and you're trying to stay connected, it feels like your frontal lobes are being scooped out. And this is quite funny, actually. Um, we see that uh, this panda here is trying to climb out of its uh, enclosure, its cage. You get what the panda's trying to do, right? It perfectly encapsulates your experience at work. Again, the whole point here is, you know, the notion that uh, work and play are necessarily separate things, and it's an anomaly or it's unusual to not work a nine to five or to wish to work outside the usual confines of a workday. Okay. 
core fun and entertainment to find in various cultures, I'd like to tell you a brief story about my experience when I was living in Kyrgyzstan and uh, partying with the locals there. Uh, where is Kyrgyzstan? Here. It's located between, well, essentially between Russia and China. It's amongst all the other stands. Afghani, Paki, Tajik, Uzbeki, Uzstan, Turmek, Turkmenistan, um, and there's Kyrgyzstan. Now, this is a photo I took um, of, a, of a New Year's celebration, um, you know, accordion. They didn't have uh, a radio or anything like that at the time. Here we've got, uh, there's me, myself. Um, and here, the basically the emphasis on this day with locals and colleagues at my school was uh, consumption. We were eating lots of fried food and drinking vodka. I wasn't, though. Women didn't really weren't supposed to drink vodka. We were supposed to drink white wine, champagne. You had women's drinks and men's drinks, but I won't get into that. Um, here's myself and some of my female colleagues from my school. And here we were actually drinking vodka. <laughs> and we did a lot of dancing. Dancing was very important. Um, one more quick story I distinctly remember. We it's a mountainous country, Kyrgyzstan, and I live down here near the city of Osh. And we took a coach trip by bus uh, with a bunch of uh, Kyrgyz and Russian cohorts, colleagues, into the mountains. And the mountains are really wild and pure and quite untouched, actually. There's not much tourism. And so the Americans in our group there were about 40 of us, had Nordic sticks and expensive trainers and, you know, all sorts of athletic gear. And it was a day that we were all supposed to basically take a day off and recreate and enjoy ourselves. So the Americans were interested in going hiking in the mountains. And the Kyrgyz and Russian colleagues, our counterparts from our schools, were basically happy to spread a b couple of blankets on the ground, in the grass, uh, take out lots of bottles of alcohol, <laughs> put out lots of unhealthy snacks, you know, homemade food, and just get slowly schnackered, drinking alcohol and eating. And so this for me was very indicative of the cultural perception of what is done for leisure, right? The Americans wanted to go hiking and the, the locals saw this as work. Why would you work up a sweat and, you know, go, well, how is that fun? And the Americans looked at the local approach to um, recreation, getting drunk and eating lots of unhealthy food as, you know, not something they wanted to do for fun or leisure. So the prevailing notion is that work and play are two separate aspects of life, which must be kept in balance. In which cultures, subcultures, societies is this prevalent, and where and when not? What does focusing on work-life balance tell us about a culture? I guess it tells us that the two are necessarily distinct from one another, and one must not override the other. Is this generational, cultural? Again, if we go back to... Um, the article on, you know, are you too creative for a nine to five? Are millennials incapable of working nine to five? Some might suppose that indeed this is generational. I've just given you a short anecdote from my own experience as another, in a, living in another culture, that this can be quite a cultural construct. And then here we see, um, <laughs> A, an ad for, you know, as soon as it's possible, who do you want to go out to eat with? And my question to you is, is this a part of your culture, your family? Do people go out to eat as for fun? Um, in my family, growing up in an Italian-American household, going out to eat was seen as a huge waste of money and time. Why would you go out to a restaurant and pay someone else to make you food when the women in my family were constantly in the kitchen cooking, you know, 
stirring tomato sauce on the stove, very sort of stereotypically typically Italian American. But I put forth that in lots of cultures, going out to eat is not really seen as uh, recreational. It's not what you do for fun. Now, here we see an interesting graph. And this is based on um, the notion of what is, uh, let's say, cultural um, constructs that have that research has been done um, into something called power distance. That's how hierarchical a society is. Individualism, how collectivist or individualistic a, a, a nation, a culture is. Masculinity, how competitive, essentially. Uncertainty avoidance, how much risk do people in a certain culture or society or nation take? Long-term orientation, is it a culture or a society or a nation of saving or spending? And indulgence, hmm, okay, what, how, what is indulgence? Well, indulgence um, is the cultural dimension defined as the extent to which people try to control their desires and impulses based on the way they were raised. Relatively weak control is called indulgence. So this is where um, people do not place a great deal of emphasis on controlling one's desires or impulses. Relatively strong control uh, is called restraint. Cultures can therefore be described as indulgent or restrained. Um, according to this research, with a score of, a high score of 68, the culture of the Netherlands is clearly one of indulgence. People in societies classified by a high score in indulgence generally exhibit a willingness to realize their impulses and desires with regard to enjoying life and having fun. They possess a positive attitude and have a tendency towards optimism. In addition, they place a higher degree of importance on leisure time, act as they please, and spend money as they wish. Now, I would like to put forth, do you think this sounds accurate? I mean, again, it is based on uh, research done. But you might also think, but that may describe my generation, but it certainly doesn't describe that of my grandparents or my great-grandparents. So again, could this indeed be generational? Hmm. Does the idea of enjoying life and having fun and how much that's allowed, does that change over the decades and across generations? Now, in terms of culture and nationality, well, here's an interesting um, breakdown. Now, this is a for-profit group, I should point out, who organize uh, outings and leisure activities. Um, and they have some data here that they've collated uh, through the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, a study of social trends in 18 countries. Here are a few highlights. The French spend more time eating and drinking, almost twice as much time as residents of Canada and the United States. Mexicans spend the least time eating and drinking. So you've got this really interesting breakdown, right? Um, average minutes per day spent eating and drinking. Now, I'd also like to point out that in my culture, in America, we have what's called fast food. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, the notion being that you get food to eat on the go, right? Like in the Netherlands, you have Albert Heijn to go. That food is consumed um, while you're doing something else. So it's this sort of idea of you eat to live, right? When I lived in Kyrgyzstan, that was very much frowned upon. Um, I remember walking to work, eating something as I was walking, and literally a woman, I didn't even know, a stranger stopped me in the street, a Russian woman, and said, no, what are you doing? Sit down and eat properly, right? That eating is not something you do on the fly while you're doing something else, 
that eating is something that you actually do. Um, sitting down, taking the time to do it mindfully. <laughs> the French also spend the most time sleeping, maybe as a result of drinking. Koreans and Japanese sleep the least. People in Norway, Germany, and Belgium spend the most time in leisure activities. Okay, we would have to then ask how, is, how are leisure activities defined according to this research. Um, significant differences in the percentage of leisure time spent visiting and entertaining friends. People in Turkey spend one-third of their leisure time with friends, and New Zealanders about one-quarter compared to people in Australia, Germany, Japan, and Spain, who spend less than 5% of their time visiting and entertaining friends. So, again, I put to you the notion that leisure and recreation varies across countries and cultures. Now, I've got a number of um, interesting links here. A short film on the unlikely ballerina, and it's about uh, Misty Copeland who has come to great fame and renown, uh, but what's perhaps unusual, or at least uh, we don't see it as often, is the fact that she's African American. And that has, yeah, basically been, you know, a different sort of idea. It kind of breaks the stereotype of what many people think a ballerina is right? You don't tend to think of someone being African-American first off. So are there also stereotypes as to um, who does something leisure-based? Who uh, sports figures and athletes are? There are definitely stereotypes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be writing articles in The New Yorker and f featuring this African-American ballerina in Time magazine, for example. Um, yeah, there are stereotypes out there. What about this article on race and winter sports? Hmm. Black people can ski? Bridging the race gap in winter sports. So there's an entire article here about the fact that people tend to think that, you know, alpine sports are engaged in by uh, white, upwardly mobile mm, participants. And then uh, an article I found on what Americans can learn from other food cultures. This is also quite thought-provoking. Um, food feeds the soul. To the extent that we all eat food and we all have souls, food is the single great unifier across cultures. But what feeds your soul? So the whole article is about, um, yeah, for example, here in much of China, the older generation shops every day. They buy fresh foods and go home and cook traditional dishes. How much does food characterize our identity and our culture within that um, sort of construct? Most cultures don't think about their cuisine in monolithic terms. Mexican, Chinese, and French cuisines each comprise dozens of distinct regional foods, and yet we still refer to them as Chinese food, French food, right? Yeah, and if Americans have any unifying food identity, it's mostly white meat culture. So this protein-centric dinner plate, right, is prototypically American. Food as survival. So this, the article is uh, very thought-provoking indeed. Um, and, it, and the author, Amy Ch S. Choi, who is Chinese-American, um, explains how the generational shift occurred in that, um, yeah, here she says, that uh, most people born after the Cultural Revolution in China don't know how to cook. The generation was focused on studying, so, you know, their parents wanted to emphasize that they should educate themselves, so they didn't learn how to cook. I mean, again, 
do these have to be mutually exclusive? No. Are they? Yeah, perhaps they are. Um, and we see here that, you know, food as a status symbol for, in this case, middle class Chinese. I remember traveling in uh, Delhi in India uh, years ago and seeing people dressed up. They'd obviously got dressed up. They'd gone out to eat to Pizza Hut. <laughs> now, again, in their culture, in, in North, you know, in Rajasthan and in, in India, this was seen as status that you could go to a fast food restaurant like what we would consider, you know, not great cuisine, Pizza Hut. But in America, it's considered kind of low class, middle class. Again, I put forth that this is all very much um, construct. Food in France is still primarily about pleasure. Think about whether you live in a eat-to-live culture. That is, you get food on the go. Food is there just to keep you going so you can do the other productive things in your life. Or do you live in a live-to-eat culture? Now, as an Italian-American, I grew up with food being a huge identifier. Um, if we weren't talking about making food or cleaning up the kitchen, we were eating it. You know, food was our identifying factor. It, it, it was very much a social act. Um, and lastly, hmm, thinking about sport, recreation, leisure, play, and food and food consumption, look at these thought-provoking statistics on obesity and ethnicity. And here, I'll close this so we aren't distracted there. Obesity. Who is affected? When, when does this date from? When was this data collected? Um, it's from the public health website. And what we see is here, who is affected? Mm -hmm. I'll see if I can find a date to see just how recent this information is. Um, while rates of obesity are rising across all demographics, certain demographic groups are more affected than others. So what we see here is a racial breakdown that black um, people's populations tend to have higher percentages of obesity and overweightness. And this is in America. Uh, the source is Gallup, okay. And this is also true of Hispanic populations. So again, in terms of stereotypes, this is thought-provoking, isn't it? That white and Asian populations tend to be, tend to rank lower in BMI and obesity class. We also see gender breakdowns. Men tend to be more obese than women, according to Gallup. And again, this would be specific to the U.S. We also see income breakdowns of obesity. Hmm. The greatest disparity is racial. Hmm. Diet, exercise, and environment likely pay a play a role, as evidenced by disparities in habits like fast food consumption. One CDC report shows African Americans consume up to 33% more fast food than Caucasians. The poor are more likely to be overweight or obese than the rich, right? Interesting, thought-provoking statistics here. Now, we're focused on looking at how cities cater to and capitalize on the needs of their citizenry in regards to having fun. So we see some interesting studies here. The places for leisure and culture are very important to individuals and communities. The natural and built environments and the resources they provide can help foster local identity, bring a community together, and reduce social exclusion. They also contribute to its quality of life and influence its environmental and economic health. Okay, we've got all these different uh, scholarly articles Furthermore, opportunities for leisure make an important contribution to an individual's quality of life and general sense of well-being. Opportunities for leisure and culture are reflected in the natural 
and built environment. Hmm. Well, that definitely pertains to cities. Well, this is an, an interesting uh, article. We've got the um, link here. Cultural diversity and leisure experiences of women in Australia. So this study explored the leisure experiences of women from culturally diverse backgrounds in the multicultural country of Australia. And what we see is that um, many parallels can be drawn but there are also apparent differences in the ways which migrants experience leisure. So they looked at comparisons with uh, and similarities between uh, results from Canada, immigration policies, and the leisure experiences of migrants, talking about subcultures. The ultimate conclusion of both studies is the same. Leisure participation falls in a continuum, and while it can facilitate the valuing diversity, it can also be an alienating experience. Multi-ethnic countries need to be aware of how attitudes, systems, and programs facilitate such outcomes and strive to be more culturally inclusive. Well, hmm. So again, in talking about inclusivity, who recreates? How is this determined? What are the stereotypes? Does everyone, for example, in an urban environment have equal access to... Uh, the built environment and to places for recreation, uh, parks as well. Here we see another scholarly article that puts forth, the healthy development of children depends in large part on the social context in which they grow up. Neighborhoods with high levels of social capital tend to be good places to raise children. We have trusting networks, common values, positive standards. Culture and recreation provide the means to build social capital. So what do we mean by uh, culture and recreation or social capital? Arts, recreational programs, community events, festivals, parades, block parties, all of this is what occurs in cities for the most part, right? And this makes neighborhoods strong, helps neighbors keep in touch with each other. Well, again, who has access to this? And are cities inclusive and equally making opportunities for recreation available to all. One more research article. Despite the fact that Europe is becoming more ethnically diverse, little is known about the outdoor recreation habits of non-Western immigrants in Europe. North American research has shown that there are major differences in the use, preferences, and motivation for outdoor recreation of immigrants and their descendants compared to the mainstream white population in North America. Hmm. So what we essentially see here is that um, managers, planners, policymakers in landscape management, integration, need to equitably and equally address the needs of a multicultural citizenry. So we've got this uh, another research study done indicating that Leisure activities, outdoor recreation patterns, it's access, and, access and distance to green space, and non-Western immigrants' perception of nature have been investigated, and that what they conclude is um, there are definitely differences in how people view public space, recreation, leisure, nature, food, consumption, entertainment, right? Okay, now homework. Given all of this, hopefully, thought-provoking content, write down three possible argumentative uh, thesis statements on these themes uh, in our, and that we've discussed in our, sorry, Wednesday classes. Do some online research. Find a source of information that you find interesting on the theme of recreation, entertainment, cities, uh, multiculturalism. And Beth, that's me, will post more thought-provoking uh, material and resources to our Brightspace page. I do hope this has been mm, interesting and thought-provoking. And thanks for watching.